Welcome back to deep learning. So let's continue with our lecture and we want to talk now about loss and optimization. There's an old saying and I don't know who brought it up first, uh, which says there is nothing more practical than a good theory. Today we want to talk a bit about loss functions and optimization and I want to look into a couple of more optimization problems. And one of those optimization problems we've actually already seen in the perceptron case. You remember that uh, we were minimizing a sum over all of the misclassified samples. And we were choosing this because this we could somehow get rid of the sign function and only look into the samples that were relevant for misclassification. And also note that here we don't have a 0, 1 category, but a minus 1, 1. Because this allows us to multiply with the class label, this will then always result in a negative number for all misclassified samples. And then we add this negative sign in the very beginning, such that we always end up with a positive value. And the smaller this positive value is, the smaller our loss will be. So we seek to minimize this function. We don't have the sign function in this criterion because we found an elegant way to formulate this loss function without the sign function. Now, if it were in, we would run into problems because this would only count the number of misclassifications and we would not differentiate whether it's far away decision boundary or close to the decision boundary. We would simply add up with a count and then if you look at the gradient, the gradient would essentially vanish everywhere. So it's not a, an easy optimization problem. We, we don't know in which direction to go, so we can't find a good optimization. Yeah, what did we about this last time? Well, we somehow relaxed this, and there's also ways how to relax this. And one way to go ahead is to include the so-called hinge loss. Now, with the hinge loss, we can relax this 0, 1 function uh, into something that behaves linear on a large domain. And the idea is that we essentially use a line, a line that hits the x-axis at 1 and the y-axis also at 1. And if we do it this way, then we can simply rewrite this using the max function. So the hinge loss is then a sum over all the samples that essentially uh, receive 0 if our value is larger than 1. So we have to rewrite the right-hand part. So we reformulate this a little. We take 1 minus ym times y hat. And here you can see that we will have the same constraint. If we uh, have opposite sides of the boundary, this term will be negative. And by the sign, it will, of course, be flipped. So that we end up uh, having large values for a high number of misclassifications. We got rid of the problem of having to find uh, the set M. Now we can take the full set of samples by using this max function because everything that will fulfill this constraint will automatically be clamped to zero, so it will not influence this loss function. So that's a very interesting way of formulating the same problem. We get implicitly the situation that we only consider the misclassified samples in this loss function. and. Yeah, you could say, or it can be shown, that the hinge loss is a convex approximation of the misclassification loss that we considered earlier. One big thing about this kind of optimization problems is, of course, the gradient. Uh, this loss function here has a, has a kink. Uh, the derivative is not continuous in the point 1. So there, it's unclear what the derivative at point 1 is. And now you could say, OK, uh, I can't compute uh, a derivative of this function, so I'm doomed. Luckily, subgradients save the day. So let's introduce this concept. And in order to do so, we have a look at convex differentiable functions, because on those, we can say that at any point f of x, we can essentially find a lower bound of f of x that is indicated by some f of x0 plus the gradient at f of x0 multiplied with the difference from x to x0. So let's look at a graph to show this concept. If you look at this function here, you can see that I can take any point x0 and compute the 
uh, gradient, or in this case it's uh, simply the tangent that is constructed by doing so. And you will see that at any point the tangent will be a lower bound to the entire function. It doesn't matter where I take this point, uh, if I follow the, tangent, the tangential direction I'm always constructing a lower bound. Now uh, this kind of definition is much more suited towards us. So uh, let's expand now on the gradient and go into the direction of subgradients. In subgradients now we define something which keeps this property but is not necessarily a gradient. So a vector g is a subgradient of a convex function f at some point x0 if we have the same property. So if we follow the subgradient direction multiplied with the difference between x and x0, then we always have a lower bound. And the nice thing with this is that we essentially can relax the requirement of being able to compute a gradient. There could be multiple of those g's that fulfill this property. So this is not unique and the subset of all of the subgradient is then called the subdifferential. So uh, the subdifferential is then a set of subgradients that all fulfill the property above. And if f is differentiable at x0, we can simply say that the, the set containing all subdifferentials is simply the set containing the gradient. Now let's look at a case where this is not true. In this example here, we have the rectified linear unit, which also has exactly the same problem. But again, it's a convex function, which means here at the point where we have the kink, we can find quite a few subgradients. And actually, you see the green line and you see the red line. Both of them are subgradients. Yeah? Both of them are feasible subgradients, and they fulfill this property that they are lower bounds to that respective function. So this means that we can now define a, a subdifferential, and our subdifferential is essentially 1, uh, where we have x0 greater than 0. We have 0, where it's smaller than 0. And we have exactly g, and g can now be any number between 0 and 1 at the position 0. And this is nice, because now we can follow essentially this uh, gradient or subgradient direction. It's just that the gradient is defined differently in different parts of the curve. And in particular, at the kink position, we have this, uh, this situation where we would have multiple possible solutions. But for our optimization, it's sufficient to just know one of the subgradients. We don't have to compute the entire set. Um, yeah, so we can now simply uh, extend our gradient descent algorithm to generalize to subgradients. So we can still do it, and there, uh, there are proofs that for convex problems, you will still find the global minimum using subgradient theory. So we can now say, well, the functions that we are looking on, they are locally convex, and uh, this then allows us to find the local minima, even with relus, even with hinge laws, and so on. So let's summarize this a bit. Subgradients are a generalization of gradients for convex, non-smooth functions. And the gradient descent algorithm is replaced by the subgradient algorithm for these functions. Still, this allows us to continue essentially how we did all of the time. For piecewise continuous functions, you just choose a particular subgradient, and you probably don't even notice the difference. And the nice thing is, that we're not just doing this, it's not just engineering, but there is also solid mathematical proofs that this actually works. So we can use this for our ReLU and our hinge loss. Yay. Ooh, AI. So mathematically sound, and we can go ahead and not worry too much. What else? Well, now people say, oh, SVMs are much better what we're doing because they always achieve this global minimum and isn't it much more better to achieve an SVM? So let's have a small look at uh, what an SVM actually does. SVM then computes the optimally separating hyperplane. Yeah? So it's also computing some, some plane that separates two classes. 
And the idea is that it wants to maximize the margin between the two sets. So you try to find the plane, or here in this simple example, this line that produces the maximum margin. And the margin here is indicated by the dashed lines. The, so the hyperplane or the decision boundary is the normal line, and the dashed lines indicate the margin here. So the SVM tries to find the margin that is maximally large while separating those classes. What is done typically is that you find this minimization problem where w is the normal vector of our hyperplane and we minimize the magnitude of the normal vector. Note that this normal vector is not scaled, which means that if you increase the magnitude of w, your normal vector goes larger. And now if you want to compute signed distances from that, you typically divide by the magnitude of the normal vector. So this means that if you increase the length of this normal vector, your distances get smaller. So if you want to maximize the distances, you minimize the length of the normal vector. Obviously, you could just uh, collapse it to zero, and then you would have essentially infinite distances. It's over 9,000! Now, just minimizing uh, w would lead to the trivial solution uh, w0 everywhere. So you put this in a constraint optimization where you require for all observations m, for all your samples m, that they are projected onto the right side of the decision boundary. And this is introduced by this uh, constraint minimization here. So you want to have the signed distance multiplied with the true label minus 1 to be smaller than 0. Now we can expand this also to cases where the two classes are not linearly separable. This is then the soft margin SVN. And the trick here that we introduce is that we allow a misclassification just by introducing slack variables xi. And xi now are added towards the distance to the decision boundary. And this means that I can take individual points and move them back to the decision boundary. But I postulate that the negative xi are all smaller or equal to zero. And second, I postulate that the sum over all the xi needs to be minimized. So I want to use this concept of the slack variable. I want to allow misclassifications, but I want to have as few misclassifications as possible. Then this leads us to the complete formulation of the soft margin SVN. And if I want to do this in a joint optimization, you convert this to the Lagrangian dual function. And in order to do so, you introduce Lagrange multipliers. They are here noted down as lambda. So you can see that the constraints that we had in the subject two line, they now receive the multipliers lambda m. And of course, there's an additional new m that is introduced for the individual xi constraints. Now you see that this forms this rather complex optimization problem. But then we have a single Lagrangian function that can be thought to be minimized for all w, for all xi, for all lambda. So there's a lot of parameters introduced here. We can rearrange it a little bit and put all of the xi's into one sum and then all of the constraints into the other sum. So this is the same as the line above, but with a slight rearrangement. And then we can go ahead because we know all of the lambda m they are larger or equal to zero. It means that everything uh, that will be misclassified should be suppressed. And you can simply replace the lambda term with the maximum function. So the lambda, in any case, as a result of the optimization, will always produce something that will be zero or greater than zero. And we here use then this trick that we approximate this by introducing the max function here, suppress everything that is below zero. And now you see that we can very elegantly express this uh, as a hinge loss. So you can show that the support vector machine and the hinge loss formulation with those constraints, they are equivalent up to an overall multiplicative constant, as you can read in reference one. So if people say, oh, you can't do deep learning and take an SVM instead, well, if you choose the right loss function, you can also integrate, incorporate 
uh, a support vector machine into your deep learning framework. That's actually a quite nice observation. The stuff that works best is really simple. Okay, some open points. Outliers are punished linearly. So there's variance of the hinge loss which penalizes the outliers more strongly and you can do that, for example, by introducing squares. So also a very common choice. See reference four. So we can also apply this hinge loss to multicast problems and what we are introducing here is simply an additional sum where we then do one versus many. Yeah? So we are not just classifying towards one class, but we are classifying one versus the rest. And then this introduces the two classifiers shown here in the very end. And then we can also construct a multi-class hinge loss. So let's summarize this a little bit. We have seen that we can incorporate SVMs into a neural network. We can do this with the hinge loss, which is a very cool loss function. You can put in all kinds of constraints. There's stuff that you can even incorporate forced choice experiments as a loss function, that's then called user loss. So a very, very flexible function that allows you to formulate also all kinds of constraint optimization problems in respect to deep learning. So you can put in all kinds of constraint optimization also in deep learning frameworks. And also very cool, you learned about subgradients and why we can deal with non-smooth objective functions. So this is also a very useful part and if you run into a mathematician and they tell you, oh, there's, a, there's this kink and you can't do it and so on, then you say, hey, subgradient save the day. We know this, we just need to find one possible gradient and then it still works. So it's really nice, check our references if somebody ever approaches you that this is not okay to perform in your gradient descent procedure. There's proofs for that. So that's also very interesting to know. We are standing on the shoulders of the giants who in the past um, simplified the problem of problem solving so much that now we have a chance to do the final step. So next time in deep learning, we want to go ahead and look a bit into the optimization. So far, all the optimization programs that we considered, they just had this EDA, and this was somehow doing the same for all variables. Now we've seen that different layers, parameters can be very different, and maybe they should not be just treated all equally. Actually, this will lead to a big trouble. But if you look into more advanced optimization programs, they have some cool solutions how to treat the individual weights differently and automatically. So stay tuned. Hope you liked this lecture and hope to see you in the next video. Thank you. Thank you.